We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, and in the 20 years since, more than 3 million troops have served in Iraq or Afghanistan or in support capacities. Many of them, more than half, were deployed more than once. And many of them have come home with challenges, mental, physical, not always well addressed by our community or not always well acknowledged. And we want to do something about that today. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by Sherman Gillums. He is a former U.S. Marine who is with the National Alliance on Mental Illness and a former senior executive at Paralyzed Veterans of America and AMVETS. Sherman, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jessica. I first just wanted to start with what's approaching. It's the anniversary of 9-11. As a veteran, how is this hitting you? I guess it's hitting me um, because I'm surprised at how much of a surprise it is to everyone that this is suddenly something to think about. You know, the the war doesn't end for people who have family members who are lost or who are injured. They live it 365 days a year. And in many ways, this has been life. Um, And it seems like the country is just now catching up to what was a daily challenge for a lot of families and a lot of veterans who have lived with this. They've tried to go on with their lives and and seeing uh, 13 fellow service members killed in Kabul, it was was kind of an extension of the pain that was already there. Um, So while we appreciate the fact that this is being recognized as as an anniversary, it's bittersweet because this has been, um, you know, daily reality for a lot of men and women who were there and left a piece of themselves in that country. I spoke to a veteran uh, while we were exiting Afghanistan, and he commented, uh, you know, we went to war and America went to the mall. He said that wasn't an unfair characterization in his view. Have you had conversations with other veterans? And what what comes up in those conversations these days? Well, I guess it's worth uh, revealing that my wife served 18 months in Afghanistan, so it was within our home. And I'll be honest with you, she got on with her life and tried to live and and she did live. A lot of it was, you know, a struggle, but she did manage to go on. But anytime we heard about Afghanistan, whether it was what the Taliban was doing at any given point or a a troop that was killed uh, in action, it wasn't, it wasn't abstract. It wasn't news. It was part of her reality. And so when we got to the point where this, this took on a, a national interest again, for her, she began to wonder uh, about the people that she met there. A, a lot of it was about what's going to happen with the, the young boys. And, and incidentally, she didn't see a lot of girls. There weren't any girls at the orphanage that she visited. And so having that perspective on the ground and the reality that she faced, she, she brought a sense of um, three-dimensionality to what was happening there. Even though we weren't there physically, she thought about a lot of what was going to happen when we left. So it was it was really personal to her. It wasn't it wasn't about the, the headlines and all those things. It was about uh, what we left behind and what she left behind. Have you discussed with veterans or in your capacity how best to cope with the feelings that are triggered by this anniversary and by the exit from Afghanistan? I've had veterans call me and ask me how they should deal with it? How do, how do I cope with this? How do I, you know, swallow the fact that we spent so much time there, we gave up so much, it feels right to leave at some point. But again, this is an abstract, how do, how do I and I had veterans uh, just seek advice on how to how to look at it. And I didn't have the answer. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I encouraged those men and women to talk to, you know, mental health providers and people who are equipped to help folks get through these types of things. Um, but even I didn't have the answers. It's, it's, it's one of those things that just kind of have to, it has to pass and we have to see where, you know, it leaves people and we'll deal with it as it comes. I want to read some statistics. More than 1.8 million veterans have some kind of officially recognized disability, that's the term the VA uses, as a result of serving. According to Brown University's Watson Institute on International and Public Affairs, Compared to the civilian population, Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans have elevated rates of suicide, mental illness, drug and alcohol addiction, car crashes, and homelessness, and veterans and their families have higher rates of divorce, homicide, child abuse, and child neglect. As a country, are we doing enough to support them? I think there are you know, aspects of the support that we offer veterans that, uh, that work, but the veterans have to find it. 
They have to, you know, get into those systems. There have to be enough providers to address the problems. There are parts of the country and in, in rural areas, for example, where we don't have enough providers to, to address the issue. So a lot of it is capacity. Um, and I will say though, that we have to be careful about what, what can turn into a situation where we're stigmatizing a lot of people who served and, and, and granted, there are concerns that we should uh, pay attention to, but, uh, but it's not necessarily just about the folks who served in combat, the suicide problem affects service members who didn't deploy. Um, so it's really about the culture and how we uh, take care of you know, the men and women who come back and, and, and how that affects the culture as a whole. That, that's really the, the broader concern we should pay attention to. And, you know, I always, it's not just the veterans. We think about the veterans, but it's also their families and loved ones who are impacted. Would you speak a little bit to that? I'll tell you the first people I thought about when I heard about 13 service members killed. Yes, it hurt to hear about those young men and women, but I thought about the families who are getting the knock at the door because that's where it becomes more of a downstream persisting pain that never goes away. When a service member returns and if he or she is met with support, that's one aspect of it. But there was a spouse. There are kids that grew up without their mom and dad. There are communities that were affected by uh, what happened. And, uh, and even though we, we put a lot of focus on the veterans, um, we can see from past wars that it goes far beyond the individual who served in country when we're talking about the after effects and the downstream effects of, of serving in those, in those hot areas. I want to ask you, on a personal level, uh, do you have an understanding or a theory why, as a culture, we don't put more of a spotlight on what these people who've served our country, gone off to fight and die for our values, um, and come back sometimes with these challenges? And too often, we all look away. It's not a huge part of our conversation. It's not a dominant theme, even in our media coverage. Do you have a theory why this is and what we can all do to, to sort of shift our focus? Hey, I think we glorify, you know, what it means to serve. We watch a lot of movies and we lionize, you know, the hero in the movie. And when the movie ends, that's sort of where it ends for us. Um, you know, I, I, I talk often about being influenced by Rambo movies and, and what I saw as the prototypical veteran who's coming back and and, uh, and, and what we would expect from people who go through that experience. Um, but it's, it's easy to look away because in this more recent era, um, we see it almost like a TV show, like a reality show. And so when we see things happening, unless your community has been hard hit by it, and, and remember only 1% and maybe even less than that um, have served in uniform during this era and, and, um, and know what it's like to be in that uniform um, and even among the families, they're oftentimes forgotten. We say, you know, thank you for your service. And, you know, we feel sorry, but it's, it's too easy to move past that. And even now, you know, we, we're not even thinking about the 13 lives and the, and the many that were injured. So it's just about, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the zeitgeist, I guess, because most people don't serve or don't have somebody who serve. It's easy to look away when it doesn't touch you personally. When the 13 Marines or the... the mostly Marines, but the 13 service members were killed in Afghanistan. Um, I got a lot of feedback online from the audience that was just shocked by how young they were. People weren't aware how young so many of the people, our, our men and women in uniform are. Can you give us a little bit of a picture of who who is serving these days and, and what's drawn at least your cohort to, to serve after 9-11? So five of, of those who died uh, were about a year old when the Twin Towers were hit. Um, I have a daughter right now who's at the Naval Academy and she was a year old when the Twin Towers were hit. And it's just in the DNA of America that there will be people who have that streak, that have that call to service. And I think because, you know, her parents served, she served, a lot of it is generational and you, it's, it's, it's a calling. That's why it's, it's just unique to certain people to do that. And, to be honest with you, nobody wants to stand on the sidelines when they have that orientation and not be a part of why we prevent people from um, fearing what happened on 9-11. I mean, I, I, the things I remember were people making the choice between jumping out of buildings and burning alive. Um, I went to Pennsylvania and I got to visit the 9-11 Memorial and I, 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 I read the biographies of the 93 people. Um, 
who, or the people who are on Flight 93. Um, and, and there's something in me that wishes I could go back in and serve. So I don't know, maybe it's just about the American spirit, um, but it's always been the case that there are, there are just some people that feel like they have to stand to watch. I know that veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan had more frequent deployments and shorter periods at home than veterans of other wars. Could you give us a sense um, what kind of impact that has on, on the veteran and their family? Well, in our family, uh, we have four daughters who grew up without um, their mom there. And, um, and we had family members that were able to fill in. Uh, but when mom comes back, you know, and even with my own, own service in the Marine Corps, they have to adjust to the consequences. And a lot of that means we have to get help. We have to sort of parent around our issues and figure out ways to uh, identify what's going on in our minds that may not be obvious until the kids are reacting to it. And I think we're gonna have a generation of kids who unfortunately understand the consequences of combat and war because their parents returned. A lot of them were not wounded physically, but they brought back you know, the, the mental and invisible consequences and that somehow colored the way they interacted with their kids. Um, and, and these are the kids that are joining right now. So I'm, I'm even, I'm, I'm thinking about the 13 and I'm wondering who in their family may have, have influenced their decision to join uh, because that's the way you kind of perpetuate the, you know, the, the, the inclination to serve. Um, but there are definitely consequences and it shows up when you see the number of veterans who die by suicide, the number of service members who die by suicide because of unaddressed issues. Um, so there's, there's sort of a, you know, it, it's good that we have kids that are willing to go in, but they're definitely bringing in uh, more of a burden than, than past generations may have, have brought in. During um, the exit, there was somebody I was trying to help get out of Afghanistan. And so I got connected to a number of veterans groups, people who were freelance trying to do everything they could to get other people out. And I was so blown away by being on the inside of this, how effective everybody was from their couch and wherever, and immediately networked and working with one another. And, and the one bit of sort of positive silver lining I saw there was that there is this vibrant community among veterans. And, and do you think it's the case that come 9-11 that they will find support, pe that people in your community are finding support by, by talking to one another? One of the, the pleasant aspects of, of getting out of service and, and, and needing to heal was coming into communities that fully embraced. They fully embraced us. It wasn't like the Vietnam War where you, you, know, you saw a, a different... Um, type of reaction. This is, you know, the country is totally bought in to this idea that we're responsible for taking care of veterans and we're accountable. And you see that everywhere I go. I haven't seen any community where I felt like I wasn't uh, embraced and there wasn't a responsibility. And the question is how, you know, how do, do they know enough to do the right thing? And, you know, surviving families, they'll get that initial support, but you can't leave them behind. You, you, you have to, they're yours, you own them. You know, you, you adopt these families and help them get through. And people do get worn down by having to carry that burden. But, um, but we have to find a way to make sure that people don't make it about, thank you for your service. It's about now, what can I do? And, and how can I pick up the burden where you left off uh, by serving? So let me ask that for folks who are watching this, um, what can regular folks do? How can they be supportive to veterans? And, you know, if they're out honoring 9-11, what do you even say so you don't sound like you're saying, oh, thanks for your service and walk on? How can you make a meaningful difference in someone's life? Honor veterans during Memorial Day, during Veterans Day, during Fourth of July. And then remember, there are 362 other days when they're often overlooked. That's the time when they need you. Don't wait until Christmas, Thanksgiving. Think about them all year you know, volunteer at a VA hospital, uh, you know, bringing water to wounded veterans and not just veterans of this era. We have veterans who have served and have lost limbs and have suffered going back uh, six generations that are still alive today. We need to take care of all of them. So don't think about it in terms of, you know, what, what it makes me feel like and how it makes me look. Think about doing the grunt work. It's ugly work to, to you know, go into a, a veteran's home and talk to a veteran who doesn't have family, you know, or a veteran that's, that's getting buried with no, no, you know, nobody in attendance and, and just do your little part. And I think all that matters. 
Sherman Gillums, thank you for your time today, for your compassion, and for your service. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Yellen. If you like this video, please click subscribe, and you can click the bell to get notifications when we post new content. Thanks for watching. Thank you.